Hell yeah, it is. Anyway, Dad sends one of his servants to Athens to figure out what the gods want us to do with him. Turns out Athens is like a week's distance on foot. We all just sort of forgot about the little dude. And he starved to death before the messenger even got back. Whoa, that's heavy. For real though, huh? Now my mom and everybody are mad at me saying that he didn't do no wrong. Because the man he let die was already a murderer. They think that it's impious for a son to prosecute his own daddy like that. But that just goes to show how little they know about what the gods think about piety and impiety. Dang. You must really know your stuff when it comes to the gods, huh? Hell yeah. Good. See, I could use your knowledge on piety against this Miletus kid. That way, when he comes around accusing me, I can shut him up with my knowledge of piety. Alright. Okay then, hit me. What is piety? Okay, see, piety is doing what I'm doing. I'm pressing charges on my dad because what my daddy did was wrong. And it don't matter that he's my daddy, just like Zeus did to his daddy. When he went and ate all his young like some kind of rabid possum, you gotta do what's right, no matter who is in the wrong. Okay, alright. So what you're telling me is what you did is pious. But that's not really what I'm asking, man. I need to know what piety is. Okay, okay, how about this? Piety is what the gods like, and impiety is what they don't. Simple as that. Alright, I can do that. Let me ask you this. Two guys get into an argument over something like cash. Can't they just count the cash and figure it out? Yeah. Right, because that's something we can measure. But what if these two guys don't fight over something like cash? I mean, like you said, sometimes gods scrap over things like eating babies or something. How are you supposed to measure that? Like if one of them is for it and the other is against it and they fight each other over crap like this, then why wouldn't piety and impiety be the same thing? Since the gods love it and they hate it. Yeah, but ain't no god gonna argue that a murderer like my dad should go free? Nobody does, though. Nobody sits there and tells the judge, Yeah, I killed him, so what? I'll kill again. Nothing wrong with a little killing from time to time. Nobody sits there and says that they shouldn't be punished for doing wrong. They argue that what they did ain't wrong in the first place. Same thing goes for gods. Yeah, I guess I can see that. So how do you know that the gods think that what your pops did was wrong? Or that you're doing right by turning them in? Well, it ain't gonna be simple, but I reckon I can do it. You know what? Doesn't even matter. Even if you prove that the gods think what your pops did was wrong, it still doesn't tell me what piety and impiety is. Let's just say this. What all the gods hate is impious, and what all the gods love is pious or holy, and the crap they don't agree on is both or neither. Uh, uh, what? Okay, dummy. Think of it like this. You like bananas, right? Yeah, man. I love bananas. Well, if eating a banana is pious, is it pious because the gods like it when you eat fruit? Or is eating a banana pious and the gods like pious things? The question Socrates asks can be framed something like this. Are right actions right because God commands them, or are right actions commanded by God because they are right? This might not sound like much of a distinction at first, but these two scenarios are actually quite different. In fact, many feel that with this, Socrates has presented us with a true dilemma. A dilemma is a situation where you're forced to choose between two options, both of which lead to unpleasant results. Philosophers have actually likened a dilemma to holding an angry bull by the horns, so the two unpleasant options are known as horns. If you choose the first horn of Socrates' dilemma, then you're accepting the proposition that right acts are right because God commands them. And this means that you're accepting that God's command alone is simply what makes something right. So in this view, God makes goodness, and by extension, this suggests that anything God commands is right. And maybe you're okay with that because you believe God only commands good things, like honoring your parents and not stealing or lying or killing. But those of you who know your Bible will remember that God does command killing when he feels like it, for example, when he commanded Abraham to kill his own son. And some thinkers are bothered by the thought that morality could at any moment become totally different depending on what God feels like commanding that day. All it would take is a word from God and we would all suddenly be living in some sort of ethical bizarro world where things that we currently think are horrible and cruel would instantly be considered good and righteous. And this, it turns out, is the subject of this week's Flash Philosophy. To the thought bubble. Here's the setup. You're going about your day minding your own business when suddenly God shows up. 
or at least he claims to be God. And he sure seems like God to you. He has nice, fresh breath and excellent posture, and his iPhone is a version that's not even out yet. Like, this guy is God. And he tells you that he's changed his mind about morality. The Ten Commandments are out, he says, or rather, they've been reversed. You are now commanded to kill, steal, commit adultery, and so forth. God says, he understands that this is confusing, but he assures you that he knows best. And this has been part of his plan all along. He was just waiting for humanity to be ready for it. So he instructs you to go forth and begin carrying out his commands. To do otherwise would be a sin. So how do you process this information? Do you assume that there must be something wrong with your brain, or that something's gone wrong with God, or do you obey? Thanks, Thought Bubble. This scenario is just one problem that comes with accepting the first horn of Socrates' dilemma. It makes God's commands and the morality that stems from them arbitrary. If God determines the rightness and wrongness of everything just by saying so, then the entire concept of goodness and value becomes vacuous. Because it means that saying God commands what is good is really just saying God commands what he commands. The idea of what's good doesn't really mean anything anymore. So what about the second horn of the dilemma? Does it make sense to say that God commands things because they're good? Maybe this doesn't seem like a problem, but it means that God isn't omnipotent. Because there's at least one thing, value, that doesn't stem from God. Instead, someone or something else has created it, and God just uses it. So if you're committed to the belief that God created literally everything, not just the physical world, then you're gonna have a hard time accepting this horn. And then there's another problem. This view also means that something outside of God, in some sense, binds him and his commands. If there's some standard of goodness that God has to stick to when making commandments, then that means there must be things that God can't command. And if the ethical rules of the universe come from some source other than God, then why can't we just go straight to that source too and figure out morality for ourselves in the same way God did. Once you go down this road, you soon find that God and his religious texts must be superfluous, little more than moral cliffs notes, a shortcut to understanding the original source of knowledge. So maybe now you're seeing why the Euthyphro problem has been around for thousands of years. Whichever horn you choose, it presents serious problems for the divine command theorist. Either God is bound by a standard outside of himself, or God's goodness doesn't really mean anything. Well, fortunately, we don't need to refute either horn of the Euthyphro dilemma because the dilemma that it presents is a false dilemma. There's a third alternative. Namely, God wills something because he is good. Now, what do I mean by, by that? I mean that God's own nature is the standard of goodness, and his commandments to us are expressions of his nature. In short, our moral duties are determined by the commands of a just and loving God. So, moral values are not independent of God because God's own character defines what is good. God is essentially compassionate, fair, kind, impartial, and so on. So, his nature is the moral standard determining good and bad. His commands necessarily reflect his moral nature. Therefore, they are not arbitrary. When the atheist demands, if God were to command child abuse, would we be obligated to abuse our children? He's asking a question like, if there were a square circle, would its area be the square of one of its sides? There is no meaningful answer because what it supposes is logically incoherent. So the Euthyphro dilemma presents us with a false choice and we shouldn't be tricked by it. The morally good or bad is determined by God's nature and the morally right or wrong is determined by his will. God wills something because he is good and something is right because God wills it. This view of morality has been eloquently defended in our day by such eminent philosophers as Robert Adams, William Alston, and Philip Quinn. Let's go to this audio clip then. All right. And any of our listeners are wondering what the Euthyphro Dilemma is, let me tell you that we, we've got several podcasts on it that you can uh, reference and can find it in Dr. Craig's work as well, uh, Study the Moral Argument. Also, we're going to let this atheist debater kind of spell out what it is. This is Dr. Zachary Moore, and it was in a debate on basically the moral argument. 
I believe the name of the debate was, Is God Good? He here describes what the Euthyphro Dilemma is, and he interacts with it. Let's go to that clip now. Now, this dilemma has been challenged many times. Christian apologists have interacted with it. I'm sure John knows them. And the, the typical claim is that, well, it's, it's not that God creates the good, or he recognizes the good. It's that he has this nature, and this nature is necessarily good. But you see, this doesn't solve the problem. This just pushes the dilemma back one step. Because we can easily rephrase the dilemma like this. Is God's nature good because it creates the good? Or because it recognizes the good? And uh, we're, we're back to the same dilemma. Okay. Now, he claims that what you write about the third alternative that splits the horns of this dilemma is insufficient because it only pushes it back one step. Interact a little bit with that clip. He does try to attack the third alternative that I lay out, although he doesn't state it quite accurately. The way he states it is, God has this nature, which is necessarily good. That's not exactly right. Rather, what the alternative is, that God is good because his nature is the good. His nature defines or determines what is the good. So. That doesn't lead to this then further dilemma, which he wants to erect, that is God's nature good because it creates the good or because it recognizes the good? That question, in a sense, doesn't even make sense. Uh, natures don't create anything or recognize anything. When you're talking about the nature of God, you're talking about his essential properties. And the Nature of God neither creates nor recognizes things at all, so the whole question is, is just malformed. Rather, what we want to say is that God's nature is the good, and that this simply determines what goodness is. And therefore, to say, why is God's nature good, or does it create the good or recognize the good, is to fail to understand the alternative. It's sort of like asking, well, is the good good because it creates the good or because it recognizes the good? Well, well, neither one. The good is good because it is the good. It defines what is the good. It is the standard. And it simply makes no sense to ask this further question. What it brings up then is what is a nature and what is God's nature? Right. And it tends to think of God's nature as some sort of a personal thing itself that can create or recognize things, when by God's nature what we mean are his essential attributes or properties. And the whole concept here of the third alternative is that God's nature is definitive of what is good. So the, the atheist, I think, would face exactly the same dilemma. I would ask him, how does he halt the infinite regress? What is his ultimate standard of goodness. And then you could ask the same question of that. Is it good because it creates the good or because it recognizes the good? Well, I'm sure he would say, well, neither one. It just is the good. It is the ultimate standard. And that's exactly what theists say about the nature of God. You're looking for a proper stopping point, and it's possible to have a, a stopping point uh, rather than an infinite regress. Sure. Uh, unless you're some sort of a moral nihilist, which I don't think he is, uh, he, he believes that there are objective values, right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And so he as an atheist will face exactly the same question. What is your stopping point that is definitive of what is good and evil? And it makes no sense to ask of that ultimate stopping point, whether it creates the good or recognizes the good. Rather, it just is the good. And the question then will be, is your ultimate stopping point a plausible stopping point? And I think that for the theist, we have a plausible stopping point in God because God is the metaphysical ultimate. There is nothing beyond God, nothing higher than God by definition. And moreover, God by definition is a being that is worthy of worship. And any being that is worthy of worship, I think, will be the paradigm of goodness. So that by the very concept of God, this is a plausible stopping point. But any other stopping point based in some finite creature like humanity or rational 
consciousness or something like that. There the stopping point seems arbitrary, and we wonder, well, why is that the stopping point? Um, that that question does seem to, to force itself upon us. With, where with God, I think you have a plausible stopping point for this regress that he wants to construct. Well, God's ultimate status provides that, it seems. I mean, he's ontologically, I think you said metaphysically, ultimate. Right. Yes, and, and the atheist agrees with that, that by, by definition, God is the metaphysically ultimate. If he exists, he is, there's nothing beyond him. If something existed that were beyond God, were greater than God, then that would be God. So I think as St. Anselm rightly saw, God is the greatest conceivable being by definition. If God were somehow held to a standard of good beyond himself, what would that even look like? I mean, I think in some of your work, uh, you said that it would just kind of float. Well, I think it would be a sort of Platonism that you would have to have some sort of an abstract object, which is called the good with a capital G, that would somehow exist apart from God, and God would conform his life to this abstract object. And that raises, I think, all sorts of difficult questions. As the one you just mentioned, I don't even understand what it means to say that the good exists independently of some concrete object that, uh, that is good. I understand what it means to say, for example, that a person is good or that some action is good, but I don't even understand what it means to say that the good just exists as an abstract object. And, and think about this, Kevin. If the good is an abstract object, well, then the good itself is not good because abstract objects aren't bearers of moral value. Uh, an abstract object is not just or merciful or loving or kind. So paradoxically, the good would not be good, which is seemingly incoherent. So I don't even understand, frankly, this kind of Platonist view of moral values. It seems to me far more plausible to think that moral values are embodied in persons and that God is an ultimate person and that persons are valuable because God is a person and God is the metaphysical ultimate. He, he defines what is goodness by his very nature. That is weird, isn't it, to think of that the good is somehow suspended or there and it's not, it's not personal. It's no, not as an abstract object. But, but, but goodness and morality seem to be of persons. Yeah. And so it would have to be like um, chemical reaction, water on Alka-Seltzer or something. <laughs> Somehow it's, it's there, and then when a person encounters it, it causes this reaction. That well, just and, and you know abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. That's right. So you don't they can't bump cause in, anything. You don't bump into the number seven. Exactly. <laughs> what is Platonism again? Well, Plato tried to solve the Euthyphro dilemma by saying that there is a thing called the good, which just exists as a sort of idea or abstract object. It would be similar to mathematical objects like, say, the perfect circle or the perfect triangle or the number seven. These things don't exist as concrete objects. They exist as abstract objects. And Plato thought that there had to be a sort of abstract object called the good, which determines what is good and what is evil by you, reference to it. Do you think he recognized the third alternative? No, this? he doesn't seem to have recognized it at all. We've got to remember this is before the influence of Judeo-Christian monotheism. This was in an age of polytheism where the gods of which Plato spoke were finite humanoid deities that were cavorting with one another, uh, copulating with human beings involved in war and hatred and rapine and so forth. I mean, these gods would not have been plausible stopping points for determining your moral good. So it's no wonder that Plato sought some sort of transcendent grounding for good beyond these finite humanoid deities that were part of the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods and goddesses. What Plato 
said was not that there was a third alternative, but that if the gods do desire the good, the good must be something that is independent of and beyond the gods, some sort of transcendent good. Now, Jews, when they came along and confronted Plato's thought, said, yes, that's right, and the good is God, not these humanoid, finite deities of the Greco-Roman myths, but the God of Judeo-Christian theism. He is the good that Plato sought. So early Christian thinkers were very sympathetic to Plato because they identified God with the good.